Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the latest Johann Cruyff Institute webinar. Today's webinar focuses on the present and future challenges to the sports industry, specifically looking at the impact of the COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic. My name is Mark Matier. I'll be moderating today's session. I'm the CEO of Quantum Consultancy and an agent for the Johann Cruyff Institute in Scotland and Ireland. So if anyone is interested in signing up to one of their world-class courses, make sure to reach out to me via social media. We have degrees, master's degrees, bespoke courses that we can provide for you, which may be worthwhile, especially during the pandemic if you're in lockdown. Um, I'm joined today by a panel of sports experts from around the world who will share their personal experiences, and their thoughts on the future of the sport industry. Um, as we're all aware, it's been a particularly difficult time for those of us in, in sport. Um, individuals that join us today, it's been no different, but they've worked hard um, to bring the sport to the, to the athletes. So it'll be great to hear what they've done, how they've done it, and the challenges they face going forward. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce, um, we have Maggie Murphy. Um, Maggie, uh, said hello to you there. Maggie <laughs> is the general manager. She's the GM at Lewes. FC um, in the south of England and a unique club in regard to their their stance on gender equity and community engagement. No doubt Maggie will give you a little bit more information on that as we as we progress. Um, she has a background in anti-money laundering, anti-corruption, human rights, having held senior ad advocacy roles at Transparency International. Um, she's also held senior roles at Amnesty International and Minority Group Rights Group International. That was easy for me to say. Um, we also ha are joined by Luis Sorna, uh, known to his friends as Lucho. Um, Lucho is a director of IGMA Sports. IGMA is an events delivery company. They run an ATP Challenger Tour um, in his native Peru in Lima. And they also are an athlete management company. So he has a unique perspective from that point of view. He is a director of a uh, tennis academy, as he's a former ATP pro, having also won a French Open doubles title. Um, and currently he's also director of the Peruvian national games that are scheduled to take place in 2021. So again, he'd likely give us some insight from his perspective from those different areas. And last but not least, we have Pedro Silva. Amongst the many hats that Pedro wears, he is a bureau member of United World Wrestling and the executive body of Olympic Wrestling. Um, he is the president of the Portuguese and the Mediterranean Wrestling Federation and he's executive board member of the Sports Confederation of Portugal. In addition to that, I also know that Pedro is technical delegate for uh, Birmingham 2022 Commonwealth Games wrestling event there. He's also been a major player in beach wrestling and its development. So maybe during the course of the discussion, you provide a few insights from, from those perspectives as well. Um, as you can see, we have a breadth of experience and expertise in today's panel. So I'd encourage you to engage with our panel by typing your questions at any time during the session. Um, if it's a pertinent question, I will address it to the panel. Um, although we might set aside most of the questions until the end so that we can let our panel speak. Um, please write your questions in the tab in the top right of your screen. You'll see it there. I can see some coming comments coming through as well um, already. So, before we begin, if you have any technical issues, um, please let us know in the chat tab, also located in the top right of your screen, and we'll look to help you um, throughout the session. But thank you very much for joining us today, and we hope you have uh, enjoyed the session and have uh, some insights from us. Um, today's topic is something I'm very familiar with, as my own company, Quantum Consultancy, have just released our event hosting landscape report from 2020 to 2028, providing insights and analytics on the impact of COVID on global sporting events. Um, it also takes a look at the future events hosting and the trends that are developing because of the pandemic. Um, that's available by contacting me via any of my social media channels as well. Um, our research has found that only 13.7% of events scheduled for 2020 actually took place and a huge 49.3% were cancelled completely with the rest being moved to 21 and 22. So. It's very clear that the pandemic has had a massive impact in 2020, and that impact is moving now into 2021. So I'd like to take us that opportunity to talk to our panel today to give us a little bit more further information 
on what that looked like for them personally and what they see the future. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to Maggie and she can tell us what it's like running um, the impact of the football club during the pandemic. Thanks so much, Mark, and, and thanks for, for having me on board. Um, as Mark mentioned, we're quite well known in women's football circles. Um, our team is a semi-professional club. Um, we're in second tier of English football, so in the top 20 clubs in the country at the moment. Um, even though we don't have that big global brand name that other clubs might have. So the teams that we play against, you know, the Liverpool is in our league or Crystal Palace, Charlton, big global names. And yet somehow Little Lewis is uh, playing alongside those clubs. Um, one of the reasons for this is that back in 2017, the club took um, a decision to split revenue equally between its men's side and its women's side. So that obviously translates into pay parity for the two teams. We have the same playing budget, um, but it also means we put equal amounts of fund into things like marketing, um, into the training facilities. We share the same ground, the same pitch and everything. So uh, as a result, we've really been able to see a big improvement in the in the women's side, but also crucially for our fans and how the club runs and our own ability to generate revenue. Uh, as a quick example, um, within just two seasons, we quadrupled our women's attendance figures and it's now on par. So the men's side of the club and the women's side of the club generate the same uh, audience just by equalizing the amount of um, marketing revenue that went into it um, in just a couple of years. So it shows what can be done. We were the first club to do that. We are still the only club in uh, Europe. Uh, we only actually know of one other club in the world that does similarly to us. So um, definitely uh, ahead of the curve, I guess, on that on that front. Um, when it comes to the effects of the pandemic, uh, our men's side is in is a non-league uh, is in non-league football. So um, a little bit more grassroots. They are classed as grassroots when it comes to the pandemic and whether they can play, whether they can't play. Um, and so first and foremost, as a club, just this season has been incredibly difficult in terms of juggling who can play, who can't play, who's allowed fans, who can't have fans. Um, We've had instances where over the course of a weekend, our men's team on a Saturday have been playing in front of fans. And then the following day, the women's team is allowed to play, but not with fans. And then vice versa. Now the women's team is playing, the men's team are not, the women's team are not allowed fans. As you can see, it's been a really complicated um, club management challenge for us just to keep the club functioning uh, with all the different rules. Um, I think that when we come to the challenges, and I'm sure that this will be discussed with, with the other participants, that impact on people has been really huge in terms of the, the mental health of our players, obviously the physical health, um, and trying to manage that as a club, how to be uh, the most supportive we possibly can be. I'm really proud actually that through the pandemic, as a result, our team cohesion and team chemistry is even stronger than before we went into the pandemic because of that pulling together. Um, so there's something interesting there about potential silver linings from the pandemic as well. But I think the other learning point for me um, running the club is, is it's been fascinating to see and to remind ourselves of just how integrated a football club is into its community ecosystem. So the impact that we had by not being allowed to play or for games to be postponed, it's not just about football players, it's not just about the club, it's not really just about our own revenue of generating ticket sales. When you are really embedded in a community environment like we are, um, there is an impact that, uh, that channels outwards. So our suppliers are all local. We really pride ourselves on having local beer and local pies and, um, you know, they've been impacted. Our, our, you know, we have an external security firm that provides us with match day security. They've been impacted, their family. Uh, of course, that. My, sorry, the automatically going on to mute there for some reason. Um, of course, that means that we can also be really positively uh, integrated in the community. And so we've been doing a lot of work over the pandemic uh, to support the community. Um, and, you know, our players have been doing things like uh, running medicine to, to fans and to owners in the community. So there's lots of ways that we've really proven that we can be part of it. Um, but yeah, I, as this conversation goes on, I'd love to talk about actually some of the positive sides of the pandemic. Of course, um, mindful of all the, the the huge impact that it's had in our communities. I'm, I'm always trying to be a positive person. So there are interesting 
positive things that have come out of it. We've certainly improved our technology in some ways. Um, and we've even landed our biggest ever sponsor as a club. Um, so those are definitely things that I'm happy to, to chat to, but I'll let the others go first. Um, that's great, Maggie. Um, absolutely. One of the questions that um, I was going to ask afterwards was, was going to be to everybody, have there been any positives from the pandemic? Have we seen any improvements? So absolutely let you, you take that question. Just to follow up on a couple of things you said there, um, very, very interesting the point you make about um, equalising the revenue in terms of the marketing spend has actually allowed you to see an uplift in the, the women's attendance to equalise that with the men's. Do you think that's a model that could be rolled out um, across football or is it something to, unique to what you guys are doing down there? Um, I, honestly, I find it astonishing that other clubs haven't done it <laughs> quicker and sooner. I mean, we're generating more money as a result. Uh, so even if you don't think about this from an ethics or from a gender equality perspective, if you just look at it from a business perspective, we now have two really strong revenue generating teams. I mean, it's it's nuts. It's just, I, that's where we're going. It's just that we're gonna get there first because we put the effort in. Um, I think, Obviously, in order to make that switch, Lewis FC is in a really good position because um, we are community owned. So we have 1,500 owners, 1,600 now across the world in 34 different countries. Uh, and those are people that look at what we're doing, like what we're doing, our principles and our values. For example, we have a strong anti-gambling advert stance as well, which people around the world are, are positive about because they see the impact in their communities of uh, gambling and football. And so those people around the world have said, hey, we we want to sign up. We want to be part of that. And I think that when you put community values and principles at the forefront of your decision making, it does mean inevitably that you um, uh, are able to make decisions that are for the good of everyone in the community, not just the men's team, really? not just one side of the club. No, I think that's an excellent point. And I, the only reason I circled back to that was because my initial reaction was, a lot of football and sports clubs have maximized the revenue streams you know so actually if you're looking for an additional revenue stream looking at your your women's team or in that in that light is an absolutely great thing to do and the fact that you guys have an example of that you know it just shows that it can be done and maybe you'll get some calls about the best practice now and how to do that you know also you may get some calls on people wishing to own a part of your club you know, if it's open to anybody across the world. So I'm sure they can visit your website and have a look. Um, the other thing I was just going to ask you about was the problems you faced with inconsistencies and the government rules and regulations and the changes. You mentioned the challenges there. Is that is that something that you've <clears throat> really struggled with or is that something that uh, you take as part for the course? Uh, a little bit of both, I think. So um, obviously at the very beginning, so say March last year, um, we were aware that something big was happening. We couldn't quite understand the, the uh, how far reaching it would be. And so we understood that the FA um, and others were in a really tricky position, that kind of great unknown. Uh, I do think though that we've had a lot of time now to understand the potential ramifications. And of course, some of the decisions are government led and the UK government has not been that great in containing the um, pandemic say to say um and then that's fed into the way that the um that the fa has reacted and responded i do think that at the moment there is a lot of gray area still um so even for example last week our game was postponed because of a COVID outbreak in the opposition mm. um but i don't really know much information yet about um what the parameters are we have rough guidelines we have guidelines just guidelines as to when a game can be postponed um, and so that can be really frustrating to work with because um, first of all, those guidelines could have been adopted back in yeah. September when the season started. We only just have guidelines now in January. So it can be extremely frustrating trying to administer and also trying to um, help our players understand why they need to take COVID so seriously. Mm -hmm. um, and you know any of that grey area, especially when it's so competitive. Whoever wins our league will go into the Super League and be playing alongside Chelsea, Man City. The stakes are very high for uh, any team that might want to. Uh, I don't know. Try. I'm not suggesting this happens, but to throw a game or to kind of like say, oh well, we might have an outbreak or whatever. So you never want that grey area, and I think at the moment there still is quite a lot of grey area. No, I can understand that, and it's it's actually 
The same happened in Scotland. I'm, I live in Edinburgh at the moment, and one of the local teams, Hibernian, played against Celtic, who had just come back from Dubai, and there was an outbreak with one of their players. And there was a there was a lot of inconsistencies. A lot of people didn't fully understand what could and couldn't be done. And I don't think that helps the situation. I think we're all trying to move forward. We're all trying to drive things on. And you know, government regulation rules, even and even federation regulation, it needs absolute clarity in order for people to move forward. So thanks thanks for that, Maggie. And um, I'm going to move on to, to Lucho now. Obviously, he's in a very different region, based in Lima in Peru, um, and is obviously facing challenges from his own um, restrictions, government restrictions. Um, having said that, um, I am aware that uh, IGMA Sport, that is run by Lucho, um, actually ran an ATP Tour Challenger, Challenger Tour event in tennis um, recently. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about how the the pandemic has affected Lucho, his business, and, and the way he's gone about delivering events. So over to you, Lucho. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, actually, last year was a, a pretty intense year. Uh, we, we were able to, to manage to do the event. Uh, actually, the timing, taking in consideration all the pandemic stuff and everything was perfect for us because in, in, in the moment that the curve is starting to go down, that was the time when we have to schedule the event. So the, the first and main problem that we had um, looking forward to the event was the budget situation because we, we needed to put a lot of testing on the event three days during the week of the tournament and one day before the event starts. So that was, of course, outside our budget in the, in the years before. And we, we needed to, to manage that and also the the main concern was the security for the for the players we managed to do the event uh, closed doors we have no public at the at the at site and the players understood their, their position and they stood also the social distancing and all the new regulations that we had as you mentioned one of the biggest problems is to communicate the national regulations, the federation regulations, and the ATP regulation, because normally they, they are not in the same, in the same situation. Uh, every organization, they have their, their, their own security measures, in, and, and we needed to, to put it all together. So in the communi communication part of the event, that was the, the, the main concern also. And we, we, we had like a, a, a small setup in the, in the first two days of the event but after that everything started to go well with with the with the players and we we could finish a, a good event for them and we are hoping this year to be a little bit difficult the different sorry uh, i don't know if it's going to be normal situation but probably we we can put some people on the event some public of the event and and looking forward to the end of the year to see how the situation with the pandemic goes Wow, so you're confident you're going to be able to bring uh, public into your events this year? Well, I have to be positive, Mark. Uh, <laughs> we know that we can make the event with no public. That's that's a positive a positive side for us because we have the, the TV and the live streaming uh, with more power this year. But uh, from looking from from the players' perspective, uh, I would like to have some people on the on the main court, you know, on the center court. I don't know if that is going to be possible. We have a scheduled event on April here in Lima as a challenger tour. Uh, I don't know if we are going to be able to do it, but uh, for that one, for sure, hundred percent sure, if we do it, it's going to be closed doors. But uh, for the event at the end of the years, we we have to be confident that maybe we can put some public on it. Okay, lovely. So I'm going to ask you a difficult question and you don't have to answer it, but given your own experiences of running a, a tennis event um, during the pandemic, do you have any sympathy for the organisers of the Australian Open? Um, I read this week about uh, Mr Djokovic and, and his, what is being called demand of the organisers. Um, what's your thoughts on that situation? Because to me as, a, as an outsider, it seems like a, a no-win situation. It's terrible for both the players and the organizers. The the problem there, Mark, as we talked uh, minutes before, is that ATP has some regulations and the Australian Open has another regulations. And then the government of, of Australia, they have another uh, regulations. The players didn't know 
if they had a positive a positive case in the plane, they will all go into quarantine for 14 days. Ah. That was the main problem. So if if they knew before that, before taking the plane, the charter that they, they take, probably the, the the situation wasn't going to be that bad because they knew what they what, what they going front in front of it, you know. Yeah. But they didn't know. So when when the positive case uh, went down, they didn't know that they were going to be 14 days in quarantine. So that, that was the main problem. From the Djokovic side, uh, it's easy to, to talk when you are in another city with no regulations and, and, and when another kind of, of, of um, quarantine, you know, they are allowed to go out to practice and everything. But uh, I think you have to respect the government regulations. Those are the ones more important. Australia is open, open the board to the players to make a huge event and nothing is going to be perfect at this time and, and they have to know it. Uh, I saw a, um, a communication from, from Bika. I think that was the, the most sense communication that, that a, a big player can make saying that, okay, we have to do it. We, have, we need to make 14 days quarantine and we have to be patient so we can go to competition in, in a couple of weeks. Yeah, no, I have to say um, I, that's that's a great answer. I was not aware that the players hadn't realised the conditions. If they if there was a positive case, they'd have to be quarantined. I didn't realise there was a breakdown in communication. But you know, from from my reading of the situation, it it seemed like a, a very very challenging position to be in. You know, you say there was government rules. You can't you know you can't flout those rules you can't go outside them but also you have to look at it from an athlete perspective and it's far from ideal so tough tough situation and it probably brings me to a question obviously um igma sports um i'm aware you and alfredo um you know you have a number of uh athletes that you manage how have the athletes been impacted during this period uh our our sport league here um if we are talking about soccer is is in a in a very tough situation because the the budget from the federation is going down. They they are all, they, they need to 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 figure out the way to put the money on the teams. The salaries are going down, but at the end, like like everybody else, they are workers and and they have to understand also the 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 economic situation of the company of the club in this case. So we we are talking a lot in in the sport wise about the mental part they have to be strong they have to know that that this is a year where, where you are not going to make the difference economic wise and also for the for the not soccer players you know uh we have diego elias is uh, one of the most important players of squash in the world and he lost a lot of sponsors last year because of the situation not because of his level but uh, because of the pandemic so the mental part for the for the players and and for the soccer players is very important to, to be strong for this this year and, and let's hope that to 2022 the, the situation is different yeah no i have to agree as, as you know i do do some work with uh, amg and their athletes and i i understand the challenges that you know a sports management company um have um that's a nice way to then introduce um pedro obviously with your background you sit as an international federation bureau member so you sit at the, the rules making level you also sit as the president of the portuguese wrestling federation as the mediterranean wrestling federation so you you obviously have a full spectrum experience of what what that's like from an athlete perspective but also from um, a decision maker perspective. Can you give us a little bit of background on what the last year has been like for you? First of all, I would like to, to, to thank uh, the, the invitation uh, and the opportunity to be here uh, sharing uh, my views and uh, hearing uh, the views of everybody concerning this uh, uh, make it or break it uh, moment for, uh, for, for sports. Uh, I would say the, the, the biggest issue that sports, uh, uh, as well as other areas of our uh, life, uh, face today is the total uh, uncertainty of uh, what's going to happen uh, tomorrow morning. Things are changing on, uh, on a daily basis. To give you an example, as president of the Portuguese Wrestling Federation, my national team during the pandemic on the last uh, three, four months, uh, at the uh, international uh, participations and uh, out of the three in two 
the rules uh, uh, for leaving and entering the, the country changed uh, uh, halfway through the uh, through the event. So we left under some circumstances and to come back, we had to adapt and, and to find the PCR tests or to find some other tests to be able just to, uh, to, to come back. Uh, and we are not talking about uh, long leaves. Some, some leaves were just during the, the, the weekend. So this uh, complete lack of uh, uh, certainty where we cannot foresee or really plan that far ahead makes, uh, uh, makes it harder for everyone and uh, also uh, makes it very hard for uh, the decision-making uh, level to, to, to establish some, uh, some ground rules that um, that uh, make it possible for all the participants to to uh, know what uh, what they can count on, as uh, uh, Lucio was uh, saying, and this raises a lot of uh, issues on uh, communication uh, also. On top of that, uh, um, like an IF is used uh, to control the rules of the game, the rules of the event. And now a big chunk of that control is out the door because the local health uh, authorities or the government uh, uh, can overrun a lot of those rules and change the, 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 the national rules uh, at the last moment. And uh, the event organizers and the IF that oversee those, uh, those uh, promoters and those uh, organizers uh, have to uh, be able to uh, adapt uh, quickly too, and uh, it's not uh, it's not that easy, because there's no consistency from country to country. There's no consistency sometimes within the the, the same uh, the same country, and that makes it uh, uh, very harder for everybody because who's making the decisions either at the government level or at the else level is not the least bit concerned about uh, sports. We are not sitting eye on, on their priorities right now at this, uh, at this moment. And what uh, Maggie was saying with all those, uh, you can play, you cannot play, you can play with the audience, you cannot play with an audience. Uh, uh, a lot of those issues could be, could be uh, eliminated if uh, the, the, the sports specialists would be uh, heard more and could be uh, integrated in the, the decision uh, decision making uh, process. Uh, I think everybody's learning throughout the, the, the course of the pandemic. I think we still don't know that much. And uh, uh, I think uh, things will tend to uh, uh, flow back to a more normal situation but uh, uh, not in the next couple of, uh, of months. Probably later in, in the year, we'll be more uh, able to, to, to do it and more capable of uh, adapting. I think high-level international competition will first, uh, uh, will first uh, be able to, to, to adapt and to create a, a new normal that resembles the, the old normal. But I'm really much more concerned right now with a use level sport and uh, the overall social development of each society through sports and uh, uh, what impact that might have, uh, not just right now on, on the, the ability of uh, the small club to, to, to live, but also on the ability of the sports system and the, the high level teams to, to, to function uh, uh, normally in 5, 10, 15 years. Um, I have to agree with you. I, I have a genuine concern about the future structures within sport and whether the current structures are going to be fit for purpose in the coming years. So, you know, I do share that opinion with you on that. And I think not just the impact to the athlete, not just the impact to the revenue, but the cumulative effect of all the small, it's like death by a thousand cuts, What's, what's the sport going to look like in five, ten years? And I think maybe there's a question I have later on about football, and I, I do think football's slightly insulated from that, but a lot of other sports that don't generate the same money, um, again, probably tennis is insulated, but a lot of sports that don't generate the same money 
are absolutely going to find challenges you know in the future but i will take you back to a couple of questions i have and what you said there pedro um my understanding is that uww have begun to run their grand prix again have we seen any changes to formats or anything different happening with, with those grand prix you did mention that there was a level of inconsistency across different regions and territories but as a whole has that been successful so far, uh, uh, we we have been able to 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 run the the, the Grand Prix, the the World Cup, and uh, and some of the major events. Uh, uh, there's a massive uh, testing uh, program, um, so that there there's a never uh, expense, uh, a big expense yeah. without the proportional uh, added the revenue. Uh, I I would say even more with uh, less revenue because of uh, the no uh, audience uh, uh, rules that have been applying to all of the all of the events um uh, everybody uh, um, within the wrestling community community have uh, have been following all the the sanitary uh, procedures on, on the events we so far have been very lucky as far as I'm aware, on all of these um, events, uh, the Grand Prix, the, the the World Cup, we only had one uh, positive case, and it didn't spread to anyone else. Uh, so there was no outbreak, and uh, it was contained. So the procedures uh, uh, worked, set in place, uh, worked and protected uh, uh, everybody, and uh, both at the, the 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 world level as uh, on the national level i think everybody in sports doesn't want sport to come back at any cost uh we are all very concerned with us but we don't want and cannot and will not allow that sport doesn't come back no matter the cost yeah and uh, uh my feeling especially uh within my country is that uh, um we can cut out sport now and eliminate that uh, that uh, area of possible contamination. Yeah. So, and we'll see whenever this is over, we'll start back uh, and recatch where we were. And that doesn't work like that. Uh, uh, either on a recreational level or a non-elite pathway uh, level, but also on a elite pathway uh, level. Speaking of, uh, I don't know, tennis or, or football for Maggie and, and Lucho, uh, I'm sure Cristiano Ronaldo or Messi uh, or Rapino, to give an example of a, a, a female uh, uh, player, wouldn't be the same players as they are if they were two years without playing when they were 14 or 15 or 10. Uh, yeah. The same for... Uh, I don't know, Pete Sampras or Guillermo Villas or whoever, if they didn't play tennis for two years when they were here, probably they wouldn't even uh, reach the, the senior level uh, as, um, as players. And all over the world, pretty much we are doing that to, uh, to all the kids. Uh, and uh, we should really put a big effort into to finding a way to make sure that our youth uh, uh, not only plays now, uh, but uh, uh, continues to play because it's good not only for sports, but most of all, is very good for society because their health will be better now, the, their health will be better in the future, and, and all the, the uh, social, educational, even economic uh, uh, added value that uh, sport brings. Uh, as to be able to continue to bring after the, the pandemic. And I'm not, uh, like you said, and uh, we will share the, that idea. Uh, I'm not sure we'll be able to do it if all the structures, big or small, are on a, a, a two-year lockdown. Yeah, it's a very interesting point. And I have to say, uh, I, we were clearly in agreement here. But my, my bottom line at this point in time is we have no concept of the long-lasting effects of this pandemic on sport and um, we really certainly have no idea what it's going to be doing to our youth so the the missing out on 
not necessarily high level sport because it obviously will affect elite athletes, but just the ability for kids to, you know, do recreational level sport for their own health benefits, you know, everything is unknown at this point in time. And it does concern me a little bit, especially because the, the powers that be, the structures in place have lost so much revenue that their ability to then make up the gap, to put in place, to support additional initiatives that will, that will basically allow the kids that have lost out to, to regain that lost ground. I just don't see that being possible. So, you know, I suppose it probably comes down to a more personal level from parents, from local communities. We're going to have to rebuild that and rebuild that to give our, our youth the right opportunities. And there was something you did, and, and actually something I would add to that is it's not necessarily level playing field across the globe. That's another important fact. You know, there are very much, um, We I asked uh, Lucho about the Australian Open. I, I'm very aware that, you know, in the likes of Australia, and, you know, the youth, the, even the elite athletes, they've got a, a advantage because they've been able to train and compete, you know, unobstructed for a vast majority of the, the pandemic, whereas most of us in, in Europe, certainly South America, have been massively impacted. So all of a sudden, it's no longer a, a level playing field, and that's going to have ramifications as we as we proceed. Um, but moving on from that, I did have one more question for you because you did touch on something very interesting to me, and you mentioned about bringing new people into the decision-making process. And it's something that I think that this is a, this is a turning point. The pandemic is a chance to, you know, change the way we govern. Um, is there any, any thoughts you have or any examples you would be of adding new people to that decision-making process or even changing the decision-making processes um, post-pandemic? I believe that uh, there's uh, on the decision making process, the political and diplomatic abilities are very, very important, but they, uh, they have to be based on uh, uh, technical uh, and uh, scientific uh, knowledge. Uh, uh, for the same reason, I think n none of our countries would appoint to the finance uh, ministry uh, someone without uh, a, a solid technical background on the area, uh, uh, but uh, when it comes to to, to, to to sports, that doesn't happen. And uh, uh, we uh, here with the Sports Confederation of Portugal, uh, we we kind of uh, uh, created a, a, a triad uh, uh, with the Olympic Committee and the Paralympic Committee. To uh, uh, unify all the all the sports federations uh, um, uh, under the same uh, umbrella, and try to uh, uh, the three organizations as representatives of the national federations to be heard mm -hmm. uh, uh, as uh, as an advisory position um, when the the, the youth and sports uh, ministry and the health ministry. Uh, um, push some uh, new regulation to make yeah. sure that uh, it is uh, technically uh, sound. I understand that the, 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 that under the extreme pressure that uh, the health uh, authorities are under uh, in any country in the world, pretty much, uh, uh, it's easy to become autistic and uh, it, it's easy to, to uh, decide and implement without hearing uh, 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 um, every party concerned, but uh, uh, I think it would be in the nation's best uh, uh, interest and not on the sports best interest that uh, uh, when those decisions are thought and uh, before being implemented, that uh, uh, there's uh, uh, a sound uh, technical background on the on the ability to uh, implement them okay uh, I'll give you a, a, a very small example we had new regulations last thursday and uh, they had to be adaptive uh, yesterday mm. and some of them were regarding the possibility of outdoor sports on a leisure capacity and i'm sure if uh, uh, like these three entities would have been uh, heard uh, in due time, 
the, the there would be no need for uh, a do over. Mm. Okay, no, absolutely great. Um, what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to throw a similar question over to Maggie at this point in time because actually um, I think that there is a potential that the pandemic can be a turning point in how the governance of sports moves forward and I'd love to hear your ideas on that. Sure. Um, yeah, I mentioned at the beginning that I think that actually there can be some silver linings, even just from a club level, um, really, really small things. But uh, now when we were allowed to have fans back for a few games uh, between September and today, uh, obviously everything had to go online. So we had to move what was quite an old fashioned ticketing process and just get it online, moving everything to contactless. These are kinds of things that we'd flagged as things that we needed to do as a club to modernize and to gather data on the fans, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But that would have taken us quite a long time. The, the pandemic actually allowed us to speed up some of those uh, types of things. Just last week, uh, as I mentioned, we are a, a community owned, fan owned club. Last week we held an online um, fans forum, you know, like a town hall session. Normally those are in person uh, here at the club, uh, down in the bar. And so you will get the people from Lewis coming along and, and, and sharing their thoughts and their ideas and raising questions. But we'd never really hear from our owners in Japan or America or uh, Nepal or Australia. And, and suddenly last week, we did that online for the first time. I mean, it's nuts really that it took us so long, but by doing it online, suddenly we had all these people from around the world going, oh, hey, yeah, I'm an owner. I live in you know, Bangkok or whatever. Um, this is what I'm thinking. And I was, it, it was fascinating that you know, we were getting all this insight and ideas from our, from our club owners, but we've never been as connected to them, ironically, um, as, we as we are now. So there are those kind of small, um, kind of small silver linings. I think though that the, the thing that has struck me at Lewis is that um, lots of clubs have shown their true colours, I think in the pandemic and in lockdown. Um, I know of a couple of clubs here in, in England that when the going got tough, they dropped their women's teams. Um, wow. That didn't go down well. The, the reputational risk that they took really backfired and there was an outpouring. In fact, one of the clubs very quickly reversed that decision and suddenly had the women's team reinstalled. Uh, personally, I don't know what those clubs were thinking. Like, where do they think the future of football is going? They think the women's football's going to die away at some point. You know, I think it was quite backwards thinking, and I, sh I think it showed um, a lack of foresight, a lack of uh, real understanding of of uh, football as a sector. Um, and also, I think it showed. A, a bit of a it was disappointing from, a, from an ethical standpoint for example at the same time the clubs that are really standing out and doing impressive things in their communities um we saw other clubs doing the free school meals here in england when the going was getting tough and the government was pulling back funding for for uh, children that are living in poverty and we followed suit and provided provided free school meals here um as well and so you can see the clubs that were actually very much uh motivated by something beyond money, motivated by other things. Um, and a silver lining for us was that on the back of the last few years of really um, being really focused on being an ethical club, a principal club, on having this equality stance, um, just uh, at Christmas we, we announced our biggest ever sponsor that came on board. And, and I think that, that was it was really nice for us to feel recognized and also for us to feel validated all this hard work that we were doing because we thought it was right was suddenly um yielding uh sponsorship and finance and and, and brands and companies that were like hang on a sec that's that's what we want to invest in that's where we see the value we can actually connect the dots between um a club and its impact in the community so in terms of silver linings i think that we feel validated that we're on the right path with our principles and that sponsorship coming in I think has been um, really really powerful. I do think that the next step going forward um, if you come out of a club environment um, and look at governing bodies I think we we still are really far behind where we need to be when it comes to who makes decisions I mean this has just been talked about but like 
who makes decisions about the future of sport? Who decides where to invest? Who decides what to broadcast? Who decides uh, uh, prize money? Who decides allocation of uh, facilities? At, at the moment, it can be very, very narrow. And, and in any space, if you are sat in a room with people that all look and sound like you, all went to the same school, um, you're going to make decisions that are really biased. And that's not un that's not just unhealthy for uh, your community and who you serve. It also doesn't make economic sense because you're really missing out on uh, understanding other financial opportunities and other uh, investment opportunities. So that diversity in decision making, I think we have to crack it. Um, now we start to see a few more women, um, a few more people who are not white on television or in decision making roles but they're very noticeable because of that but it's so far away from being representative at the moment as well so i i still think you know i've certainly been in rooms um where as uh i'll, I'll give an example of super quick story i was in a room with um uh, i shouldn't really have been there but i ended up being in there there's about 100 people it was uh invite only and i ended up being in this uh, event for marketing professionals interested in sports. These are all the brands, all the sponsors. And there was one sponsor in particular that was pitching his um, his brand's new advert about how, you know, this great brand they were going to be advertising. And 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 he had told us when, when they flashed up the logos of the sports and the clubs and the teams that this brand was sponsoring, they were sponsoring a, a major um, Super League female women's football club they were sponsoring i think um the netball world cup and the cricket world cup for women and when mm -hmm. the advert came on it was all just men and it was that kind of like very fast motion it was kind of inspired you know it was one of those classic inspirational adverts mm -hmm. and at the end i just raised my hand and i said um was it a tactical decision to not include any of these incredible female sports that you do sponsor into your advert and the guy was kind of a bit flummoxed. He didn't know what to say. And I realized that normally he presents into that room of 100 people and there were only six women in that room. And I realized that normally people are like, wow, that was flashy, that was cool, that was great. And I was the first person that probably just said, hey, what, what, about, what about the women or what about some other thing? He mm. genuinely never thought about it. And I figured if that is the cycle that people are going into and they're only speaking to one audience, they're losing out on this huge audience over here. Um, and women's sport time and time again is showing that uh, brand, uh, that people, fans of women's sport are really loyal to brands that back them. As soon as we launched our latest partnership with Lyle and Scott, a clothing brand in, in England, I was getting messages from people who support different women's clubs saying, I've just been on the website, I've bought loads of their stuff, I really like this. They don't support Lewis, but they, they like a brand that is supporting women's football. So yeah, I just think that there's like that that understanding of how we make decisions and diversity, it, it's crucial and we're so far away from it yet. And so back to back to sort of the, the question on it, do you think the, the pandemic is gonna make any difference to those homogenous groups? Will they open their doors to different people from different perspectives? Do you think it's made any difference or is it a separate issue altogether that we need to address or or can we use this turning point to, to make a difference? Uh, it, it, I, I don't know. Um, obviously, I hope that it will be a turning point. Um, and there have been some positive elements. It was the Premier League that provided the initial funding for the women's football, elite football, to get tested week in, week out. So that the reason that we were able to get tested and stay participating was the Premier League understanding that women's football was, was uh, worth investing in. Um, so I think there's a growing understanding that there is value um, and there is growing pressure in England, at least, for the diversification. Uh, you know, major people in football in England have lost their jobs recently because of comments made that were um, like, you know, decades out of date. So I, I want to say yes, um, I am an optimist, but I, I'm a little bit sceptical still. I think it will still be slow and I don't want it to be slow. <laughs> I suppose it's a case of watch this space and see what happens. But at the same time, I think it's you guys are showing us a great example of what can be done. You know, your decisions have been validated. You know, your equity, uh, your equality between the men's and women's team have, have borne fruit with your new sponsorship. So let's hope that you're um, a good model for those other clubs and 
you know, change what you can change and hope that others come with us. Um, brilliant. So just just on that, I'd like to throw over to to Cho, just to see if he has any experiences of any silver linings, any positive things coming out of the, the pandemic, any innovations you might have seen, anything to give us hope for the future? Well, actually, for, for, for the present and for the future, the, the close future, let's say, everything is going more digital and virtual. I mean, we have to adapt. And, and that's one, one key point of, of our, our business. Uh, if, we might, if, if we want to continue making sport events, even if they are professional or not, we have to adapt a, a platform where we can put some more energy in the virtual and digital part. That's for sure. And the other thing is that for, for us, the, the companies that they still have the chance to make some, some events, we are, we are actually showing some, some solid, uh, how can you say, um, solid part of the, of the company making the, the whole the protocols work and uh, all the insurance to be, to be taken care of with the, with the players and with the, with the different clients that we can have. But uh, as the way I see it for, for the close future, the digital part and virtual part uh, is going to be a key part, a, a, a important part of the of the events for now into the next, I don't know, two or three years. Okay, no, I, I do tend to agree with you on that. And I suppose the other question would be, have you managed to find any other revenue streams or bring on new sponsors or supporters given the additional cost of running your events and the reduction in revenue um, from the no spectators? Have you find a way to offset that or is that is that a work in progress? Yeah, we, we had the chance to put uh, some two two new sponsors for the last year event, and we are managing to to make a a new tour in South American ATP Challenger Swim with a new sponsor, a global sponsor. But uh, I think that 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 is because of the wave that we are moving of the last four or five years. I I, I don't see it as a new as a new how can you say a new era of sponsorship. I I, I believe this is. This is accounting of, of the, the effort we, we have made in the last five or 10 years. Um, with, the, with the platform we, here in South America, the, the new platform, the Disney platform uh, with the ESPN and Fox Sports uh, channels uh, is getting bigger and bigger with the content of the sport. So we have to take care of that and, and we have to, to probably have a, a new partnership with them to, to put the content, you know, a, a, a global part of the TV public that is interested in sports. Excellent. And I must say, as a panel, you've all been incredibly positive. You've all managed to do, you know, great things during what is a, a really, really difficult time. And, you know, bringing on new sponsors, continuing your events, making things happen, it's absolutely great. But I'll stick with you, Lucho, and I'll ask a question that I will then ask to the other two um, members of the panel. Um, Tennis is an Olympic sport, correct? Um, as a tennis expert, as a lover of the Olympics, I know obviously you're an expert on delivery of major model sport games, you know, from your time at Lima 2019. Um, what's your thoughts on the challenges of Tokyo? Um, the opening ceremony is scheduled for the 23rd of July this year. Do you think it's going to go ahead? And if so, what will it look like? Uh, I mean, I have to answer you as a, as a sport fan and I have to answer you as a, a, a director of events. You know, uh, I want Tokyo to happen. Uh, I love the Olympics. I think it's the most inside, exciting time for the sports. It's a big, the big event uh, for us. But uh, I, I don't know if, if, if we are going to be able to, to see it, you know, uh, even if it's Tokyo, even if it's Japan, that they have all the protocols and, and we know that they have been probably in advance of the social distancing and, and the mask and everything, you know, in Tokyo, they always take care of that before of the pandemic. And, and I believe right now they're, they're probably, probably the, the most advanced country in the world. But uh, I, don't, I don't see the way to have an Olympic event with no public, Mark. I mean, I, I saw French Open, I saw the US Open, we are going to see the Australian Open now. We saw the, the or we are watching the, the soccer all around the world with no public. And man, it's not what, what, what we want to see. I mean, not for the Olympics. Uh, that's me talking about the heart, you know? Yeah. I don't know if, 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 if it is, uh, 
the 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 position of a, 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 as a as a solid event but uh i want to see olympics with with the with the whole crowd and, and the public uh sharing that moment with the with the athletes absolutely and i i agree completely i'm i'm a massive lover of the uh, of Olymp the olympic games and the olympic movement in general and i i feel your pain when you speak about an olympics with no spectators um as somebody that's been involved in the, the organization of major event and um, somebody that's got a responsibility for the peruvian national games um do can you see the tokyo organizing committee overcoming the logistical issues you know that such as we saw with the australian open we discussed can i, I, can I LOC do that after working in lima 2019 uh and and knowing the people that have the experience of of these multi-sports events i believe that they they can manage the logistics yes i i i i am positive with that i don't know if they're going to be able to control the pandemic that that's another thing you know um, we are not talking about logistics we are talking about the the, the pandemic and how it's going to spread and and if the line is going down and and everything but uh logistics way i mean i, I believe that the, the, the people is capable of doing it no i i do agree and i am familiar with a lot of the people that are involved with tokyo you know within the ioc and i understand the expertise i i just don't know if it's going to be possible and your point about controlling a pandemic you know that those decisions are out of anybody's control and who knows what it's going to be but i will i will go to maggie to hear her thoughts on it because i know pedro's thoughts on it um and we'll we'll leave him to the end to, to share them with us but We'll see what Maggie thinks about the upcoming Olympics and the likelihood of it going ahead and what it might look like. Yeah, this is tough because I, I can only speak really as a fan. So, uh, you know, I love the Olympics coming around. So I find myself enthralled in sports that I never even knew existed. And that's the beauty of the Olympics. Um, I, I can't talk from an events management perspective, but I, at the same time, I can't really see how it's going to be possible to keep people safe and I feel like there might need to be a threshold um, decided and that threshold feels strange it's not just about the athletes of course but it's all the people that live in Tokyo itself and what's the impact on the huge amount of infrastructure and logistics that's involved in hosting a games and all those people that may be uh, living in Tokyo who are going to be forced to to work in conditions they don't feel comfortable in I, I I don't know. I, I just, um, I'd, I'd love it to go ahead, but it has to be safe, and I'm not, I'm not 100 sure that it can be safe for everyone, not just the the athletes. Yeah, and I think you raised a number of good points there. That, that it, it has to be a safe environment for everybody, including the local um, population, and that's where my thought process is that I think we will see an Olympics. I'm sure we'll see an Olympics that any of us are familiar with. You know, the loss of crowd might end up having to reduce the sport program because some things are just not physically possible. You know, I wonder, is it possible to hold a, you know, time trial or cycle road race event or a marathon through the streets of Tokyo? Um, I don't know if these things are possible anymore, but, you know, those are those are obviously being looked at at the minute. But I will ask my friend Pedro Silva to see what his thoughts are on this and see, see what he comes. Obviously, you have a close affiliation with this. You're involved in the Bureau of an International Federation that is an Olympic event. So I'd love to hear your perspective. So disclaimer, I'm speaking <laughs> for myself. I'm not speaking on behalf of any of the organizations where I'm president or sit on the board. Uh, uh, and I, I would start to address some of the remarks of uh, Lucho and uh, Maggie. Uh, I know my good friend uh, Mark uh, didn't see Liverpool uh, be champion uh, uh, for many years. Do you really care that there was no audience on the staff of the of the competition uh, last year, or you're just happy to be champion? Do you think Klopp cares there was nobody sitting in the stands when he raised the cup? So, people that devoted their lives to being in the Olympics people who devoted their lives to be Olympic champion. 20 years from now, the medal will still be there and they'll be as proud as uh, uh, the stands were packed. So if we think 
of, of the of the bigger picture. I think yes, we all wanted a, 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 a normal Olympics, but these were the cards we were dealt with. So it is what it is. I I think honestly, I think that if the Champions League could adapt to be played with no audience last year uh, on a single uh, country in a couple of stadiums, uh, uh, if uh, uh, the world was able to adapt to this panda pandemic and, uh, and, and cope and, and survive so far, I think the sports world and the biggest or, uh, uh, entities, the biggest organizations in the sport world will make it a point to prove that they can uh, host the, the the games. Yes, I'm sure that the the Japanese authorities play a big role uh, uh, on this, and I, I I'm sure that the final world world will uh, stop there. But I think that everybody will uh, uh, like the light at the end of the tunnel. They will make sure that they are able to to deliver that light at the end of the, tun the tunnel. I'm not sure if the games will be disputed uh, 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 <laughs> with no crowd, with just local crowd, in a bubble, with everybody quarantining for 14 days. I, I don't know how, but I'm uh, uh, really, really, really confident that the games will happen and not even a zombie apocalypse would uh, would stop them that is what i believe and i believe on, on, on the on the ability of the of the sport people the sports people and the sports world and people all across the the, the globe coming together and delivering uh, this uh, new hope um to uh, to the sports world and to the world itself Brilliant. Unsurprisingly, you're bullish about it. That doesn't surprise me in the slightest. Um, I take your point on board that you'd like to see it as a, as a beacon of hope. Do you see it? Do you see the format changing? Do you see any limitations? Do you see removal of, of anything that we would hold as a norm in the Olympics? Or do you think they've got the capability to do it all? I, I think that the, the, the sports program will try to, to be maintained as much uh, as possible. I'm not sure if uh, there, there there won't be some adaptations to event like to road events uh, that uh, might cause some uh, some uh, issues uh, uh, to contain the the so-called bubble, but uh, I I think we'll uh, we'll see a, a sports program as close to uh, to the uh, regular one uh, as uh, as possible. We might not see anybody in the stands that I believe. I have no issue on, on yeah. seeing that happen. I have no issue on seeing uh, uh, only local uh, state. Uh, I have no issue seeing a, a difference on the scheduling. So no, no competitions uh, overlapping and, and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I don't see, and hopefully I'm right, is the game's not happening. Great. Well, we'll make that the final word on it because I'd like to leave in the positive of we're all going to enjoy an Olympics this summer. Um, okay, so one last question, and it's probably, again, slightly political, um, but I'm going to throw it out there before we go to a few questions that people have asked. So if you've got some questions, make sure to put them in the, the questions tab. And if you want to ask to anybody in particular, put at in their name and I will address it to the the individual. We do have a few there already. I see Maggie's, you know, being feverishly typing away to, to answer some questions. We might we might discuss them. We might put them so that everybody can can hear them as well. Um, but the last question is, you know, we've all talked about the challenges to the Olympics. We've talked about the challenges to your own sports. From my perspective, the, the one sport that seems to come out of this well, despite the challenges, has been football. Has it's a, the major leagues have, have continued to proceed. The, you know, as we mentioned, Liverpool crowned champions last year. So all the important things have happened. Um, has this given has this given football more dominance in the sporting world? Um, I will throw to Lucho from a tennis perspective. You know, he obviously has a 
represents football athletes as well as other athletes. Um, how do you, how do you feel the pandemic has has impacted the the makeup of sport? Has it has it just increased the popularity of football, and or has it changed the way we view it? I believe that uh, the audience is getting is getting higher. Uh, not only in tennis, but in other sports. I mean, the, the ones that uh, were able to 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 reprogram and to reinvent the, with a new schedule or be, with the new with the new format. Uh, we had a lot of time of of, of waiting of of big events and and all the people were very excited of of having new soccer, the Champions League, like Pedro said, uh, the the ATP events, the the Grand Slams. Uh, I mean, you, you, you know me, Mark, and you know that I, I am a, a huge fan of, of triathlon, long distance courses. And last, last year, was it? No, it was this, at the beginning of this year, they make the World Cup in Daytona with a new, totally new format and was huge on TV. Mm -hmm. So I believe in, in every top circumstances, there they are new chances of, of reinventing and, and to grow. I believe some sports has grow, have grown. You know, like triathlon, like tennis, like the PGA, uh, uh, for example, and uh, we have to take that uh, those those advantages that the, the the this new era is giving us for for the virtual and digital part. No, that's a, that's great. I have to say, in my mind, we could summarize that is it's not necessarily football that's benefit, but anybody that's continued to innovate and continue to bring content has seen the advantages of that. Um, I'll give it to Pedro now for his opinion before we, we let Maggie have the last word on it as our as our football expert. Um, your thoughts, Pedro? Well, I think some sports clearly uh, benefited from uh, from the pandemic. I, I, I'm not sure if benefited is the right word, but uh, they gain advantage over other sports. Uh, there's a couple of, uh, uh, of national federations that uh, increased the number of uh, licenses um, this uh, past season uh, in Portugal. But that has to do uh, uh, with uh, munching off uh, federations that cannot uh, uh, regularly uh, practice uh, their sport. So if a kid cannot do wrestling, maybe he'll go to tennis because tennis was uh, still uh, being played or cycling or something like that. And uh, I'm not sure if that will stick overtime because now they m might be playing tennis because it's the only sport available but when everything reopens uh, uh they might uh, change back to their old sport or if they don't like it they they won't stick it and we'll lose uh, someone that practices sport uh altogether uh concerning like the the, the online and the tv uh, deals i come from a portugal uh, i come from a country portugal where uh, uh, soccer, football is a, a religion, and it's like a, a eucalyptus. It uh, uh, drains uh, all the attention and all the resources away from other sports. So there's not a big difference there, but I, I can tell you that uh, um, the data, they lost around 90% of their licenses from one season to the next, because there's no competition below senior level. And uh, uh, just because of that, there's a tremendous impact uh, uh, on their number of licenses. And uh, I'm sure they will be able to bounce back faster and stronger than most other sports. But uh, all the other sports uh, won't be able to if this situation is not reversed uh, quite, uh, quite soon. Um, I'm not, I don't want to say that uh, we cannot practice uh, sports, but in reality, we cannot practice uh, most sports mm -hmm. because we can only practice sports with a three and a half meters uh, distance from uh, one another. And that cuts out pretty much most of the sports, uh, um, all of the team sports, uh, all the combat sports and whatnot. In some of them, you can still do some sort of skills, but in others, you cannot even do any, any kind of, uh, uh, of skills. So football was affected uh, uh, here in Portugal in that, in that way too. Uh, regarding the, the, the attention, it, it couldn't be any bigger uh, uh, in my neck of the woods. Uh, and I'm sure in pretty much most of like West Europe, uh, I don't think there, there should be uh, 
uh, uh, much difference uh, from uh, from uh, from before. Uh, football was already the dominant sport uh, uh, on media, so uh, it, it, they were able to 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 profit from it here now. Yeah. But I don't think it's a significant uh, increase on on that matter. Lovely, lovely. So it's an interesting point. You say at elite level, absolutely profiting at the at the grassroots community level, maybe not such a clear picture. So we'll throw to Maggie because, as we say, she's our resident expert, and see what she she thinks on that question. I I think when it comes to the elite level, Pedro's totally right. It's all about television. And so um, the only reason that the men's Premier League came back so quickly was because of those big deals that they were going to have to repay, if not. So some of those decisions were all about retaining as, as much of that finance as possible. And then as a result, it's on television. People don't have much to do, so they end up watching what is on television. Um, I think some of the broadcasters will probably have done pretty well. I certainly know that in my household, we've extended sports packages where we wouldn't normally have done because it's there. And as a result, my partner is watching club rugby in South Africa or New Zealand, you know, stuff that he probably wouldn't normally be watching, but it's on television, therefore he'll watch it. Um, I think, interestingly, on the local participation, on, you know, kind of more grassroots, um, locally here in, in Sussex, it, uh, where Lewis is, um, the local cricket club uh, played more games than they've ever played in any previous year. So in the summer, when the restrictions were at their uh, weakest, I guess, here in England, they were allowed to play cricket. And because it was one of the only things that people were permitted to do, they ended up doing it. I think that was quite um, similar for golf. So golf saw this huge uptick in the number of people wanting to play. So who knows, with those two particular sports, in terms of general participation, especially where maybe it's not in winter, you know, participation is lower anyway. When it comes through to the summer, those two sports might come out higher in terms of grassroots participation, who knows? But yeah, I think when it comes to the elites, it, it, TV is king. And so if you're not already on TV, yeah, good luck. That's, that's gonna be difficult. No, and those are all interesting points. So, you know, to sum that up, it was, it was a slightly cheeky question just to throw in at the end there to see how we all felt about football and its perceived dominance but i'm very glad to hear that we you know across the panel we, we're in agreement that you know innovation is key um that actually sports that have brought themselves the ability to to put their elite sports on are now being broadcast same with the grassroots level there's opportunities out there with different sports the footballs or the the crickets of this world or the crickets of the the tennis or the golf of this world might actually get a look in from other people so you know very very interesting so uh, what i would like to do now is jump across to some of the questions um i've been seeing questions coming through i i warn people um for the next sort of 15 20 minutes um i warn the panel that i i noticed some familiar names i've seen uh paul and narelle colin people that i know um loretta that have expertise in sport so they're not going to take your answer lightly so you're going to have to give them the the right answers here but i'll start actually with a, a slightly different one and I'll, I'll give it to maggie who's just spoken because it's from jacob you know who's looking for an example of somebody doing good work in the sports sector to deliver better governance better diversity and improved inclusivity is there is there somewhere you could signpost them to or a good example you know beyond what you've talked about today maggie uh, i think that the, the thing that I can think of is um, specific people that are doing some really good work, often against the the, the grain. Uh, in terms of good examples of, of sports or teams or clubs as a whole, um, I, I don't mean to be pessimistic, but I do think that there's um, some real challenges and that, you know, people are, the, the, the structure's just, aren't necessarily there yet. Um, I've been quite focused on the on England at the, uh, most recently. I used to be a little bit more internationally focused, so I'm going to do people a disservice if I claim to um, to speak for some of those the brilliant examples that are happening more internationally. Um, here in, in England, even just with the focus on, on the Football Association at the moment, there is a strong part of the FA that deals with women's football, but it is kind of, sometimes it feels a little bit like it's in a bit of a silo. It's not always going 
all the way up to the top. And I think that's one of the things to, to break through is how do you move the silos into into something which is a little bit more holistic. Um, it's it's a good question, and I'm not I'm not providing any answers. Uh, I'll probably kick myself shortly. But um, <laughs> is, there, I'll come back to it. is there a case where maybe some organisations? Now I know you've got a background working for the likes of Amnesty International and things like that. Or I'm thinking the likes of maybe Stonewall or somebody that is in a particular part of the community, but actually have sport outreach programs. Is there any any good examples or good governance coming from? From different areas into sport if sport is a little bit underrepresented there yeah i think there's some really good uh, groups out there um i'm always impressed with the work that fair is doing football against racism in europe they have kind of international partners around the world they're always doing um, really brilliant stuff very much at community uh at community facebook stretching all the way up um beyond sport are doing some great uh bits and pieces of work women win in the netherlands huge amount of uh, work that they're doing out there uh, again connecting uh programs around the world uh really focusing on women's uh, diversity and, and just making sure that women are act, uh, being participants and being active as well um you know beyond sport they're doing some great work actually internationally i think there's lots and lots of groups that are working really really hard and some actually i'll tell you what some interesting examples on specific country level uh jordan uh, in the Middle East, doing some fantastic country level, um, community level sport and development work, which I think is just fantastic. And they've got brilliant leadership right up at the top with uh, uh, Prince Ali, um, who is, who's really focused on sport for development, sport as a, uh, an opportunity to unite communities and doing a lot of work with refugees, but always with a focus on uh, making sure that women and girls are part of that, not just uh, boys. So there are some really shining examples of brilliant community-based programs that that are out there. Brilliant. Hopefully, that's given Jacob a, somewhere to start at least um, when he begins his research. Um, okay, I will jump to a very specific one from Narelle asking Pedro if you see the games going ahead in Tokyo, um, how do you imagine that a positive COVID test will be dealt with, in particular with athletes who might be favoured to win and then be excluded from the competition, specifically with close contact sports like wrestling? What what I would say there there are several there are several uh, ways to address that. Uh, if we force everybody to quarantine for forty day fourteen days upon arrival, they arrive with a negative test. They uh, do a second uh, a quick test and a second PCR test upon arrival. They quarantine for fourteen days. Uh, uh, when it comes to competition time, we shouldn't be uh, dealing with uh, those issues if they live in a bubble. Maybe there's no budget for this. Maybe there's no logistic uh, uh, ability to uh, uh, put everybody in a, a quarantine for 14 days uh, uh, upon arrival. Uh, we can address that as uh, with the same protocols uh, uh, other sports have been uh, doing uh, throughout uh, the, the, the world. I'll give an example. Uh, we are playing now here in Portugal, the final four of the um, of this football league. And there was a big issue because uh, uh, yesterday on the first semi-final, uh, uh, my sporting, sporting uh, brilliantly beat the uh, FC Porto 2-1. Um, and there was a big controversy because there are uh, infected uh, COVID positive uh, cases on both sides. And sporting couldn't play with two players that have two false positives. So if you, if you draft uh, a comprehensive uh, regulation beforehand and uh, that uh, uh, you make sure that uh, you will uh, enforce no matter what uh, um, then you just have to 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 follow the, the the regulations the regulations must be fair and must be uh, drafted and validated not only by the sports uh, um, governing bodies but also by the health uh, authorities and then might hurt some people might uh, uh, steal a medal from someone that uh, with no covid would be uh, the champion but you if you draft a, a fair regulation you, then you just have to uh, to enforce it right. but i still think it's possible to uh, to do uh, uh, to organize the games with very few to none uh, positive cases. It costs, okay. it costs much more and it can be a logistic nightmare, but it's possible. 
Yeah, no, I have to agree. It, it is possible. It's that logistics is is the key to it, and and I think you touched on it. And it's similar to Lucho's point about the Australian Open. If it's a fair process and it's communicated effectively, then there's a very good chance we can move ahead with it. Um, one last question. I think we'll go for it unless anybody else has has any they want to throw to us. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it to Lucho based on the fact that he mentioned that you know his ATP talent challenger tour event might be coming, becoming part of a wider number of events in, in South America. And it's from Alan, who's asked, Alan from AMG, um, asking, could governments in each country work together to activate a model for international athletes to compete globally that could supersede national and, and federation regulation? Is that a realistic aim? Is that possible? Is it something uh, we discussed? Uh, I want to say... I, I want to say yes, but uh, in the in the real life, I, I believe that here, at least in South America, uh, the issues that the government have, they're a lot more bigger than the than the sport wise. You know, I mean, uh, I talked to the organizer from Chile event uh, last week about the the protocols that they have to to have an event in a couple of weeks from time now. And he actually told me that uh, probably he has a contact that can talk to the Minister of, of the Health here in Peru. But those are things that uh, I cannot even propose, you know, but we, we, we have such, such a, a, a big um, impact because of the COVID that I, I don't see the governments working together to have a saving traveling for the tennis players, for example. I believe right now that it's, it's not going to be heard. Probably in the after we 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 close the second wave of the COVID, uh, we can we can try to work on it. But uh, I don't see it uh, happening soon now. OK, no, I, I have to agree with you. I think in an ideal world, we would we would love to have some sort of protocol that was agreed across national boundaries. They could protect athletes, they could protect event organizers, but you, your point is very valid that governments are facing so many challenges that, you know, and things change so rapidly that I'm really not quite sure that's, that's even possible. Um, but no, fair question. Um, if nobody has any other questions and if the panel don't wish to, to add anything, um, I'm going to wrap up the session for today. Um, is there anything that anybody would, would like to add? I, I would just add, uh, uh, Paul uh, um, did some uh, question uh, regarding that. Uh, is it it's quite possible that uh, there will be more pandemics in the coming years? Yeah. Alongside plans for the recovery of sport post COVID, do we need to build resilience for coping with future pandemics? And how should we prepare? Uh, uh, yes, uh, most definitely. If all goes well, uh, uh, it will take another century. Uh, to uh, to come and uh, we won't uh, be dealing with uh, the, the issue and uh, whoever comes uh, is as blind as we are now facing this one. Uh, but if it comes in the future years, I'm sure we'll we'll uh, try to use whatever good learnings we have from this uh, from this pandemic. But uh, I, I don't think we can do any serious preparation till this one uh, is over. We, we are worldwide too over, overwhelmed trying to, to, to fix all the leaks that we have uh, right now that uh, I think everybody's just trying to cope, learn some things, and then uh, uh, we need to be over this one to prepare for the next. Yeah, no, apologies, first of all, for, for missing Paul's question. Um, I hope he won't be offended by that. And, um, I do agree with you, Pedro. I think let's deal with the hurdle that's in front of us. But actually, we should now that we've learned the lessons from from this particular outbreak and this particular pandemic, so that we don't make the same mistakes we made before. And that's at all levels, you know, from national right down to the sporting level. So, you know, hopefully, hopefully, it's it's not as debilitating um, as the last year has been for sport because I think we can all agree that we're very positive, but. It's been a it's been a very very challenging time. Um, so without further ado, I think that that's a nice point to wrap up on. I think from my perspective, I really love to thank the panel today. I think your perspectives have been brilliant. Your insights have been absolutely wonderful. I hope the audience has enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, I appreciate your time. Um, 
and it remains just the audience for joining us and, and remind them that um, there will be a link to the, the webinar that you, you can watch at your leisure and to make sure you reach out to us on social media and find out more about what we do and how we do it. We'll be happy to engage with you there. But other than that, thank you very much and, and have a good day. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Mark. It's thank been you. a Thanks, pleasure. Mark. Thank you.